Welcome everyone here today. Unlocking Revelation Seminar. We've had a, an incredible Bible study, night after night. We're doing it today uh, here to celebrate the Sabbath day, the day that God has given us. I'd like to welcome each one of you here. And uh, God is good. Isn't he? Amen. Amen. That's, uh, have you ever did that before? God is good. All the time. All the time. And all the time, God is good. He is. Praise God, He is. Um, I'm going to open up that. I'm going to open up a prayer one more time, okay? Father, if there's ever time that we needed a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, Lord, to truth, it's now, Lord. Here we are, your children, our ears are open, our hearts are attentive. Please speak to our heart through your Holy Spirit as your word is open to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The year was 2004. 2004. Some friends of Cindy and I had, um, had asked us if we'd like to study the Bible. I'd never studied the Bible before. Nobody had ever even asked me to study the Bible. I was 40 years old, um, making a mess out of my life, destroying my life. Um, and these Bible studies were making a huge difference. I want you to know there is power in this Word right here. Life-changing power in the Word of God. Changed my life forever. You know, I tried for years and years uh, to, to give up to, or to walk away or to, to be set free uh, from the bondage of sin I was in. I was, I was like a prisoner. I was chained to, to what I call compulsive habits, alcohol, drugs, lust, tobacco, and I could probably name a whole bunch more. And, uh, but as I was filling my life with Jesus, these things that had a grip on my life was setting me free. God was setting me free. I heard a friend of mine said that you can't stomp sin out of your life. You can try and try and try. You can't do it. But you can crowd it out with Jesus. Fill Amen. your life with Jesus. They invited us on uh, to a camp, a camp out. They called it a camporee. They called it a pathfinder camporee. I've never heard of a pathfinder camporee. I'd never even heard of an Advent as far as that goes, but I, I, I'd never heard of a camporee, and I said yes. And we were going to go up there a week. Now, you've got to understand, it had been 20 years since I had went a week without alcohol. 20 years. Amen. Amen. That's the power of God. 20 years. Got up there to this camporee. 30,000 plus young people. Young people. I'm convinced God was pouring out His Spirit in a powerful way that day, that week. I know He was. God's not going to let 30,000 young people come together. He's not going to let two young people come together, but He's definitely not going to let 30,000 young people come together in one place seeking Him and not pour out His Spirit. And that's exactly what he did. He poured out his spirit. Their theme for this camporee was faith on fire. Faith on fire. It was a, it was a story of Joseph. You know, Joseph, Joseph lived a pretty tough life. You know, he had to go through a lot of stuff. But in all of it, God was able to turn it into good. And, and so this camporee, what we would do is we, they had a skit, a play that they was doing each night. And, and uh, what we would do, we would carry our lawn chairs, and we would all gather in this huge field. And it was a huge field, if you could imagine, 30,000 young people, you know, in a field. And plus the, the adults, the chaperones that was there with them, and the, and the pathfinder leaders that was helping them out. So we would sit in our chairs, night after night, and we'd watch this, this, um, this what I would call, play acted out on, this, on the life of Joseph. Sitting in that chair one night, sitting in my chair, I asked God to set my faith on fire. Friends, I want to tell you, when you cry out to God from your heart, 
and you ask Him to do something in your heart, He will do it. Amen. When you search for me with your whole heart, I will be found in you. That's what the Bible says in Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. 11, I, I like 11 through 13. God's got a plan for your life. He had a plan for my life. He's got a plan for your life. That my life was forever changed. I've been I've been living the Christian dream ever since. Amen. Clinging to Jesus. I've learned the key. Cling to Jesus and don't let go. Amen. Don't let go of it. Keep I loved our little children's story we had. Keep your eyes, keep your thoughts on Jesus. That's the key to it. Amen. All day long. Even in the storms. The storms of life, they will come and go. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, He will just get you through it. Friends, I want to tell you, I believe with all my heart, God is looking for a people, a chosen people. You are chosen, called by God. He wants to set you on fire. He wants to set you on fire. He's looking for a people that will not bow down to compromise. He's looking for a people who would just dare to trust Him that will commit their life to follow Him, that's willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to talk to you today about a group of young men that was that was literally, their faith was set on fire. Uh, and and uh, you've heard the story, it's found in, in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, if you want to open up your Bibles with me, go to Daniel chapter 3, picking up in verse 14 right now to get started with. I want to highlight this, Daniel chapter 3 and verse 14. I think we'll have it up on the screen here also. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the, the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in sympathy with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And, and who is this God? Who would deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the, if, if that is the case, I like that. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able. Is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us. From your hand, O king. But if not, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Amen. Wow. Talking about faith on fire. I want that kind of faith, don't you? I want it for God. I want, it, I want my life to give glory to God. Standing. Standing. Tall for Jesus. Let's unpack this. Let's unpack this story here. You know, back in, in verse 1. Going back to verse 1. It, what's going on here? In rebellion, in rebellion to God, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had this huge gold image that he had set up on the plain of Dura. And he erected and he invited all the important people to this event. Everyone important in the kingdom to come to this event, and he tells them, he tells them, when the, when the music is played, I need you to bow down and to worship this gold image. Now I want you to notice something here. Notice something very important here. He gave them an ultimatum as a motivation to worship him and, and his gods. Did you notice that? He says, if you, if you don't bow down, you will burn. If you don't bow down, you will burn. The motivation was what? Fear. Fear. See, the issue that we've got here in Daniel 3, friends, the issue is worship. That's what this is all about. True worship or counterfeit worship? True or counterfeit? Love or fear? 
Love or force. That's that's what you see here in Daniel. That's the context. Now, now I want you, I want you to think about this. Uh, think about what's happening here. A powerful world leader is, is commanding is commanding worship of a counterfeit image. Isn't that what's taking place right here? Okay. And does that sound familiar? Have, if you if you heard this, a universal world leader passed a world decree telling telling us to worship on a certain way on a certain day setting up a counterfeit system of worship. Do you recognize that from the from our scripture reading that we just read earlier? Now for those that are watching on Facebook and YouTube, I'm going to share this with you. Let's just in we're going to hold our finger because we're going to continue through Daniel. But I want to read this scripture here found in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15. We're going to put it up on the screen uh, perhaps for the ones that are here uh, that they can, can watch. And um, now remember, in our, uh, remember in our Unlocking Revelation seminar, one of the things that we learned when studying Bible prophecy, the, the, book, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation go hand in hand. They unlock each other. It's just when you put the two together, it's like it's like getting a three D image. You can, you can, it just opens everything up, and you can see so much clearer here. Listen to this. Listen to the scripture in Revelation thirteen and verse fifteen and sixteen. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as it would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Isn't that what we see in right here? Now, see, this happened in Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, right? But now God is telling us this is something here that's going to be taking place because this is an end time prophecy here in, in Revelation 13, right? And, and so history is, is would not worship to be killed. He caused all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their forehead uh, on, the, receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now, here's my question. Does that really sound like true worship? Is that true worship? Is that how God would want us to worship Him? Out of some kind of force or something out, out of fear? Can I, can I say that? No, friends. God is love. God is love. You could summarize this Bible in one word. And that is L-O-V-E, love. God loves us. He draws us with his love. But when you, when you look at Calvary, which every, every Bible study that you do, in the very backdrop of every Bible study, you've got to have the cross of Calvary. You can never understand the Bible apart from in the lens of the cross. God loves you. He cares about you. This is a God that cares about you. Not a God that's trying to scare you. Not a dictator. Not a God that's trying to force you. But a God, when we look at Calvary, a God that's winning us with his love. He's on the cross of Calvary. He says, I love you this much. Do you trust me? Will you trust my word? Will you trust the Bible, my love letter to you? Will you, will you trust that I really know the future? And I really know what's going on behind the curtains. It's possible that, that, that you're deceived. I want you to know the truth. Friends, if we want rock solid truth, we've got to go to the Word of God. Because the Bible is very clear that we are no match for the deceiving power of the enemy. We've got to go to the Word of God. The only thing, friends, that's going to draw people out of Babylon is the love of God. Amen. That's the only thing. You're not going to be able to persuade anybody of anything. You can't do it. It's the love of God that touches the heart. We might be able to touch the mind. But friends, only God can unlock the heart. And it's, He's chosen love to do that. That's His basis of His whole kingdom, is love. God operates by love because He cares about us. That's just who God is. And we are God's chosen that He's called to share this wonderful message of love to the whole world. To prepare the world for his soon return. Now, the Bible is very clear that there is a counterfeit. That God is revealing to us that there is a counterfeit. The devil, uh, every good thing that God does, the enemy loves to counterfeit. He loves to counterfeit. And, and so he has got a counterfeit 
day of worship. It is. And, and, and it's very important. We're talking a lot about that. We're talking about that uh, in, in all of our meetings. But today, I want to kind of go a different direction. By looking at the crowd here, um, I think that, that, that most people here know about the counterfeit day. But did you know that there is a counterfeit way to worship God too? There it is. We've got to be careful. Any kind of worship that is not motivated by self-sacrificing love is not true worship. It's a counterfeit. And that's what you've got to be dangerous. That's what you really, that can be dangerous if you don't know that. If you can write, it's not what you know as much as it is who you know. Okay? Who you know. You know, before God, before God can use you to draw people out of Babylon, there's got to be something bigger than self burning inside of you. There's got to be. God, 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 anybody can see through this, friends. He, there's got to be something burning inside of you. I know the guy that, that I told you that, that was doing Bible studies with me. I met him, and, and we talked for, for a while, and I told my wife, I said, it's just something different about that guy. It was something different. I've been around a lot of people that call themselves Christian. There was just something different about this guy. Um, and, and come to find out, I found out late, my wife said, well, he is a Christian. And I said, you know what? That guy wasn't fake. That's exactly what I told her. I said, that guy was not fake. Friends, God will place an anointing of the Holy Spirit. He wants to set you on fire and other people can see him burning you Amen. through the Holy Spirit. That's a fact, friends. This is something that you can have if you plead with God for it. People watch us. They're longing for a religion that will satisfy the heart and change the life. They're looking for the real deal. Anybody can call themselves a Christian. Anybody can say, I've got truth. Friends, but, it, but, but when Jesus Christ lives in your heart, you can tell. Do, do you really want to convince somebody that, that you have the truth? Let them see God in you. Let them see God in you. Let, let them see you not compromise, not bowing down when all the world, every, everywhere else is doing it. Let them see that. Let them see you feeding the poor. Now, let, them, let them see you helping uh, the, 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 the elderly and the needy. Young people, uh, you, you can declare God is king by, by, by keeping yourself sexually pure. When, when all your friends are just living a free lifestyle, doing whatever they want. You can do that. You can stand up for Jesus by doing that. Young people, you can stand up for Jesus by not watching the same movies and listening to the same music that all your friends is. By not playing the same computer games that you know you don't need to be watching or playing with. You can do it. You can stand up for God. These are the ways you really stand up for God. By being, being peculiar is more than not eating pork. Uh, and, and, and not going to church on Saturday, I promise you. There, there, there's a difference here. It means we are not like the world. It, it, mean, it means that we are more like Jesus. Amen? Amen? That we're more like Jesus. People are starving for Jesus Christ. People are starving for Jesus. Daniel chapter 3, verse 7. Everyone else had bowed down. Everyone else had bowed down. But, but apparently some folks didn't have their eyes closed. Because they went running up to the king. Running, oh king, could you just picture them? Oh king, oh king, there are three that will not bow. Remember what you said? If, if they don't bow, they will burn. So Nebuchadnezzar gave them another opportunity. I, I want you to mark this down. The devil will always give you another opportunity to compromise. You'll always get a second chance to compromise. He's going to do it. Verse 14. So he calls them, is it true? Did you, I mean, he, could, he was kind of shocked here. Did, did you not hear the music? Maybe maybe your ears were plugged. Maybe, maybe you didn't understand the instructions here. So I'm going to give you one more chance to compromise. Verse 16, and they said, King, don't even waste your time. I like this. Are, are you still with me here? Are you still following me? 
Don't even waste your time, King. Don't, e don't even do it. You, you can play it if you want. We're not bound. Amen. Don't you love that, Jerry? Yeah. We're, not, we're not bound. Now, how, many, how many of you have figured this out right here? That sometimes when you take a stand for Jesus, when you take a stand for Jesus, when, when you're on the front line doing something for Jesus, there's going to be some heat. That's right. Because you're on the front line. There's going to be some fiery darts. It's just going to happen. And they're going to come from every angle. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Verse 17. I, I love this. And listen to this faith right here. If that be the case, if that be the case, our God, who we serve, is, say it with me, church, able. He's able. He is able. He's able. He is able. I want you to know God is able. He's able. He can do it. We, we, we know He's able. We know God can solve the problem. He is able. He can solve the problem in this crisis we're in right now. He can solve this COVID. This has not caught God by surprise. This crisis has not caught God by surprise. He will get us through it. We just got to keep our eyes on Him. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus is what we got to do. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We know He can. We know He can put food on the table. But if not, we, we, know, we know He can heal us. We got some stuff going on in our body. We know He can heal us, but if not, but if not, O oh King, O oh world, can I say, we will not bow down. Amen. We will not bow down. Because we worship Him. We worship Him. Not for what He does, but for who He is. We worship our God because He loves us. Amen. Because He cares about us. Because of Calvary. Because of the sacrifice that He made for us. That's why we come to church. He's got my back. He's got my back. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. You know, this made Nebuchadnezzar mad. I could just see the, the veins popping out in his neck here. That upset him. Yeah, and the devil starts coming out of him. Out of him. Verse 19. He can't believe that they would stand up for God with this kind of persecution. Total shock. This kind of he could not believe this kind of declaration of faith from these guys. My friends, just so you won't be shocked. Every declaration of faith will demand a declaration of war from the enemy. It's going to happen. He's not going to allow you to talk about how much you love Jesus and, and, and not come against you in some way. So he said, turn up the fire. Uh-huh. Turn up, turn up the fire. You know the story. How many times? Seven times. Seven times hotter. Seven times hotter. You see, when your faith goes up, the fire is going to go up. It's, it's just going to happen here. They, they made a decision. They made a decision to start going to church. Faithfully, turn up the fire. They, they made a decision to start having family devotions with their children. Every night, turn up the fire. They, they made a decision to start giving a faithful tithe. Turn up the fire. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. Amen. You've been there. You've been there, and I can keep on. I can keep on here. But you will not compromise. Praise God. Praise God. So the Bible says in verse 21, they are thrown into the fiery furnace. Thrown into the fiery furnace. And, Neb and Nebuchadnezzar watches as, as they are supposed to be destroyed. <clears throat> He watches as they're supposed to be destroyed. 
Anybody getting excited? Is there supposed to be destroyed here? You know, Prince, did you know that when you go in the fire for Jesus, that you go in the fire with Jesus? Amen. Did you know that when you can, when you take a stand and, and, and you make a decision that you're not going to bow down to compromise, that you're not alone, that Jesus is right there with you? Every time. He would never leave you nor forsake you. Because when when Nebuchadnezzar looks in, in, what does he see? He doesn't see he doesn't see three, right? How many does he see? Four. He sees four. And the four look, looks like what? The son, the son of God. The Son of God. Now, now understand this. Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan king. Right? He said he has never seen God. He's never seen him. How does he know what God looks like? How does he know? <clears throat> this is what I've been trying to tell you. This whole message right here. Because when God's chosen are in the fiery furnace and they refuse to give up their faith, people who have never seen God will see God in you. I hope you got that. Friends, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're in the fire and, and, and you are still faithful to God, you still don't lose your faith. Friends, people are watching you. They are watching you. And when they see you go through these fiery trials of life and you don't bow down to compromise and you cling to your faith, friends, that's when people see Jesus Christ in you. That's the most powerful sermon that some people will ever hear in their whole life. Amen. It, it's when that happens. When you stand for God at any cost. Let them see you go through a crisis and still praise God, and they're going to come up and say, I want what you've got. Will you study the Bible with me? We don't have to, we don't have to tell all these people, oh, we got the truth here, and we got the truth, and we know about this, and you're wrong here, and you're wrong there. Live Jesus Christ, friends, and they will come to you and they will ask you, well, tell me what's different. And you can study the, open up the Bible and let the Bible tell them. Amen? Amen. One last point before I close here. Verse 20. The Bible says that they were bound up and thrown into the fiery furnace. This is so important here. They were, they were bound up and thrown into the fiery furnace. Down from head to toe. Did you know that before you go into every fiery trial that you go in bound? That's right. You do. Bound by our carnal weaknesses. Bound by our natural tendencies. Bound by our weaknesses. Friends, we are broken vessels. We're prone to wonder. Amen. We just got it in us, right? And see, our enemy knows our weakness. He knows where we're weak at. And that's where he attacks us. He's so deceiving. And, and he knows if he throws us into the right situation, that you're more than likely to compromise and fall. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? Because he wants the fire to destroy you. Yes. That's what he's trying. Some of you, he's trying to destroy you right now. And you know what? And you know what I'm talking about. But see, and he, this is the good part. I'm gonna start bragging on our God. Can I do that? Amen. But but what the devil didn't plan on is God being with us in the fire. Uh huh. That's what he didn't plan on. You know, see, our God is a sovereign God. And he's got the ability that no matter what, Romans 8 28, that no matter what God, what <coughs> enemy throws at us, God can turn it into good. Amen. I'm going to prove it to you here. I'm going to prove it to you. In other words, God, in other words, now I want you to really pay attention to the rest of this, okay? In, in other words, God would use the very thing that the devil meant to destroy you, destroy you with, to set you 
free. You're going, oh, what? How? Did, did, you, did you catch this in the story? Did you catch this? The fire didn't destroy anything but the chains that bound them. Right? That was the only thing that was destroyed. Now, praise God, I know this to be true in my own life personally. I know this to be true in my own life. Satan knew my weaknesses. He knew my nature. He knew my pride. He knew my self-worth. He, he knew just where to tempt me. He knew just where to get me at. And I fell hard. I fell hard. And I became a slave to my carnal nature and, and, and my chains of addictions. And I was bound completely. It was destroying my life, destroying my family. And it got hot. It got really, really hot. But I know now, it took the fire to save me. Amen. It took the fire to save me. I praise God for the fire because the fire saved my life. Amen. I was so full of self, so full of pride. No, God could never reach me there. I didn't have no need of God in my life. I had everything I needed. I didn't need God. God loved me too much not to let me stay where I was at. He loved me enough to let me fall. He loved me enough to let me go through the fiery furnace. Praise God for the fiery furnace. Amen. Praise God for the fiery furnace. I, I, would, I would not ever have realized my need of God until I fell deep into that fiery furnace. I didn't know. God, listen to this. God took what Satan meant for bad and he turned it into good. He did. Amen. Because, because when he turned up the fire, when he turned up the fire, all the chains that I had been a slave to burned away. Amen. When he turned up the fire, praise God. If I just kept going, I won't go into detail, but if I kept going on the life I was going, it would just kept dragging out and kept dragging out. But he turned up the fire. Praise God. Amen. Now you know why I get so excited. Amen. Jesus Christ can set you free. Amen. He will, and He wants to. Amen. Praise God when we're going through the fire. Yes. Praise God. <clears throat> Praise God even in the fire. Especially for the fire. Because God will bring good out of it. God saved me. God saved me not from the fire. God saved me not from the fire. God saved me in the fire. Amen. Hallelujah. But because God is sovereign, and He is, because He's sovereign, the only thing you lose in the fire are the chains that bind you. Praise God. Amen. So, verse 26. So, Nebuchadnezzar, He calls him out of the fire. He, he calls him out of the fire and he, and he, and he, and he does this like a, a sniff test on him. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you know, read it, read it. He did. Uh, at, on the hair of the clothes and he realizes the fire had did them no harm. No harm whatsoever. Why? Because God is able. He is able to not let you look like what you've been through. I don't look like what I've been through. Amen. I got all my teeth. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. That's how good God is. I, I don't look like the man that I should look like. God can restore what the locusts have eaten. Amen. He can. He's able to do that. He's able. He's able. And some of you don't look like what you've been through. Amen. And you know what I'm talking about. God has sustained you. He has picked you up and, and He's carried you through because our God is able to do that. Now, do you know why those boys wouldn't burn up? I, I used to live in northwest Oklahoma. And out there you had, uh, you could see 10 miles in, in a row, it's all flat land, and, and the wind blew all the time, and it, and it never rained. 
That is all the ingredients it takes for a fire. And every year, these fires will break out and the winds will get a hold of them. And we, we, we you watch the news, saw the fires, and, uh, that, that the fires that have been going on around the United States, especially over in the West and the North. Uh, but one of my friends was a firefighter. And I asked him, I said, I said, why do you fight these? He's a, I said, how do you fight these fires? He said, we set fires. I went, what? He said, on purpose. You set fires on purpose? Yeah, that's what you do. Yeah, it's called prescribed burning. He said, what you do is you, you get in front of the fire and you set a fire. And I said, why do you do that? He says, because fire can't destroy what's already burned. The fire can't destroy what's, there, what's already burned. Amen. So why didn't they burn? Because, they're, because the fire couldn't destroy what was already burned. Mm -hmm. I'm wrapping up here. Those boys had already given God permission to set their faith on fire. They had asked God to do it. Prescribe burning. I give you permission, Lord, to burn anything in me. Anything that's not of you. See, friends, our God, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Amen. He is a consuming fire. And if we give Him permission, and that's all it takes, this could happen right now in your life. It could happen right now. Just like it happened to me when I was in that lawn chair. In 2004, that was 16 years ago. Oh, and I asked God to set my faith on fire. And I am a pastor right now. And I have had an opportunity by, the, by God's mercy and grace to lead many people to the Lord since that time. Amen. Because I asked Him to set my faith on fire. Amen. Are you willing to ask God to set your faith on fire right now? Are you willing to do that? Give him permission to set your faith on fire. God's waiting on you. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to pray on behalf of all those that are watching and all those here today. And dear God, I don't believe it's an accident that, that, that we're watching and are here today. And I pray in the name of Jesus, not in my own name, but in the name of a crucified, risen Savior, claiming His precious blood on each person watching, listening, and is here, that you would set their faith on fire. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I hope you tune in tonight. We've got a wonderful Bible study. God bless.